I'm Brian Taylor. I'm a postdoctoral research fellow here at Mayo Clinic and the Division of Cardiovascular Diseases. Uh, so I'm from Glasgow in Scotland originally. Um, the accent is, I guess, fairly strong still. My family like to tease me that it's weakening with every kind of passing day that I'm not uh, in the country anymore. Um, I think for me, for kind of point A to point B, I grew up very active, very sporty. I was a competitive swimmer and a fairly competitive soccer player, made it to a reasonably high level at that sport. Um, but was also, also a little bit of a bookworm all the time. I liked being the best in class. I liked getting A's. I liked coming home with a fantastic report card. So it was always, I guess, uh, an inevitability almost that I would go to, to college or university. Um, at that point, no one in my family had ever been to college or graduated. I was the first one to do it. So I went off to do my undergraduate degree at Glasgow University. I did it in physiology and, and human, human exercise science. Um, I just kind of fell in love with the whole idea of the heart, the brain, the lungs, the muscles all working in synergy and how you could never really have a right answer. It was, all, it was like a, the best jigsaw puzzle ever that you could never solve trying to figure these things out. So I had a lot of fun doing that, a lot of fun particularly in my practical labs. And when it came to time of graduation, um, you know, everyone has that, that thought, what do I do now? Do I go and get a real job? Is it, you know, do I start paying taxes? Oh, oh my word, and the panic sets in. And for me, it was basically a 15 minute chat with my, my supervisor at the time, um, my, my advisor. He advised I would go on and do a PhD because he saw that I liked the research side of it. And that was kind of that. So first and foremost, um, I'm going to be, the, I guess, the main coordinator of all the research, so of all the, all the techniques that go on um, from the start to the end of each testing day, how the equipment's laid out, calibrated, set up, any urgent issues that arise, I will be the first one that people will come to. Um, so I guess I will be the, the study coordinator, if you like, from that point of view on the, on the, the, the mountain itself. Uh, me personally, myself and uh, Dr. Summerfield are going to kind of work in tandem a little. And our real interest is in the appearance of lung fluid and changes in, in lung function. So our theory is, is that a lot of this increase in lung fluid, we, we can't necessarily explain why it happens. We think we know the mechanism. What we can't explain is the variance between people and almost within the same person, you know, from exposure to exposure. So we feel that it has something to do with disrupted sleep. So for me personally, I'll be measuring lung fluid through our echocardiography technique to look at what are called comet tails. In effect, they're like an, an artifact that shines up uh, bright white on the screen. And they're, they're thought to reflect um, fluid in the, in the space between the walls of the alveoli, the sacs within the lungs, and the lining of the lungs themselves. Uh, we'll also be doing a technique um, called the DLCO technique, or the lung diffusion capacity for carbon monoxide. And all that simply does is a subject will take a, a big deep breath of different gases, one of them being carbon monoxide, and we'll measure within that breath how much of the carbon monoxide disappears. The more that disappears, the better the lung and blood or vasculature conductivity or how they talk to each other almost. If that's impaired, if fluid builds up, that should be impaired and we should be able to measure that too. Um, the last little technique we've kind of added on is um, ex exhaled nitric oxide. So nitric oxide is produced naturally in our, our body. It dilates the blood vessels, specifically the pulmonary vessels, as a really high affinity for those. And our theory is, is that those who are adapting perhaps best will have a greater exhaled nitric oxide, which will dilate the blood vessels more and perhaps prevent this buildup of, of fluid. So all those three measures together we think will combine and tell a story. Um, and hopefully we'll see them all just kind of line up nicely. You know, the guys who have the most fluid will have the higher pressures, will have the bigger changes in gas diffusion, and will have the lowest exhaled nitric oxide. That's what we'd like to see. So fr from a heart failure uh, perspective, um, the typical symptoms we see in heart failure patients are an increase in how you breathe or a hyperventilation that's chronic. Um, we see an increase in pressure within the pulmonary vasculature. Now that can be because the left heart, the left side of the heart, that confuses people when we, see, when we say left and right heart. It makes it sound like you have two. The left side of the heart, when it starts to fail, the pressure increases and that causes an increase in pressure centrally. There can also be what we call a reactive component to it, where um, 
different biochemical markers, things like endothelin-1, which are very vasoactive, can increase and cause this constriction. We see an increase in sympathetic drive, so the drive from the brain to speed up heart rate and breathing frequency, etc. They are all very much apparent in heart failure patients and can, in a lot of them, um, increase lung fluid. Well, we see almost the exact same things at high altitude. We see the same increases in pressure inside the pulmonary vasculature. We see the same increases in ventilation and heart rate. We see the same increases in sympathetic drive. So. The, the synergy between the two, I don't want to say conditions, but between a heart failure patient and a healthy person travelling to high altitude are, are very, very, you know, very strong, they're very alike. Um, from an ageing point of view, which is our, our other main aspect, as we age, the vasculature, the heart itself becomes stiffer. It, it loses its elastic properties, um, becomes more fibrous and um, it's harder to stretch, harder to, to accept the volume of blood. And that then causes that increase in central pressure, which may cause an increase in, in this um, fluid flux into the lung. So I guess wherever you slice it, we think it's all very much centralised to the lung circulation. Um, and there's several factors that may affect that, whether it's a, a failing heart or a stiffer heart with ageing, or an increase in sympathetic drive with heart failure. And we see that at high altitude as well. All those things together tell a very, a very neat story, I think, how the, those three those three things you mentioned, altitude, ageing, heart failure, all link quite nicely together. I'd say for me personally, I, man, what, what, an, what an opportunity to not only go to Mount Everest, but to climb up to base camp potentially further, but to do my research, you know, to, to combine a, a pastime that I love doing and a job that I love doing into one with a bunch of some of my, my best friends is just, it doesn't really get any better than that, it's, it's fantastic.